Hello, everybody. We're going to be starting in a minute or two. Welcome to the 50th webinar. I think Steve has promised to do a dance for us, right, Steve, for the 50th? <laughs> that is not a true statement. <laughs> but you, you probably we may have some volunteers. Uh huh. Or, or actually, our presenters. Did you know that? by accepting this invitation to share at the 50th webinar it meant that you had an extra duty that you had to you know perform which is uh you can choose to dance or sing or uh share a talent all right <laughs> no pressure i thought we no, just I got one thing for sure yeah you know well, Mike? <laughs> i said i thought we just got paid more Ah, okay. Yes. We'll double your payment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get started. We have a lot to cover today. And thank you, everybody. This is Hiana Park from SpyPom Partners. I'm actually filling in for Matt Hardy for this part of the webinar. Um, but uh, to all of you joining us online, welcome. Um, this is our milestone 50th webinar in the Transportation Asset Management webinar series, sponsored by Federal Highways and AASHTO. This is also the fifth installment in a special TAM webinar mini-series. The purpose of the mini-series is to take a deeper dive into the topic of improving your next TAM. The next installment in the mini-series will be scheduled too soon. Uh, for the last session, uh, we were looking, uh, for this last session, we'll be looking at the TAM maturity levels from the Federal Highways 2019 TAM reviews. I think we're all waiting um, to, to see those results. We're still working on clearing some of the final hurdles in order to share these findings, but we hope to have the webinar scheduled sometime in March. So last week, our webinar provided an overview of life cycle planning and management in the context of improving your next TAMP. We had an excellent Q&A as part of that session. If you missed it, I encourage you to look it up in the AASHTO TAM portal where you'll find more information on this webinar series as well as all past webinars. Just visit tam-portal.com and click TAM events in the main menu. You can also register for upcoming webinars as they're announced. There you'll find archives of all previous webinars. Links to the video and slides from today's webinar will be posted on the site. You can also download the slides for today's webinar on the menu bar um, for GoToWebinar. If you have any suggestions on future webinar topics or have questions for the presenters today, um, during the webinar, please submit them um, to the Q&A feature of the web webinar menu bar, and we'll answer, answer all the questions um, at the end of the, the webinar at the Q&A session. Um, and uh, we're, we're hoping to have extra time for Q&A today and looking forward to your questions. So now I'll turn it over to Steve Gay for a welcome on behalf of our series co-sponsor, Federal Highways. Thank you, Yana. Hey, and this is awesome, our 50th webinar. Mm -hmm. Yay. <laughs> and, and I'm really excited that, you know, here we are in this mini series, and Federal Highway is a proud sponsor of working with ASHTO with these webinars. This series is first and foremost an opportunity to share practical, useful, timely information with the asset management community. I'm glad to see so many people returning to join us for this installment of Improving Your TAMP. We're looking forward to seeing you on many more webinars to come. I'm really excited about today's webinar. I think we have some real good presentations from the bit I've heard from the state here who are participating. And, you know, let's look back. In many of the first camps we have, Agencies were early in the understanding of risk management in the context of asset management. 
since then, many agencies have improved their understanding and practices related to TAM and risk management. In the next camp, agencies will have the opportunity to improve their risk management and resiliency elements to reflect their program. You know, we often hear the risk of being extreme weather, sea level rise, seismic issues, money, or even staffing. You know, we're going to probably not touch on all of these today, but they're all important issues affecting most of the agencies. So we think this session will be useful and informative. We're here today from practitioners who will share some of their experiences and insights. We'll also hear from one of my good colleagues from, I'll say, from down the hall on Federal Highway and, and what they're doing with uh, the whole risk side of thing and linking it to asset management. I think you are going to enjoy today's presentations and discussion, and I hope we'll all learn a lot this afternoon. I'm certainly looking forward to it. I'm going to turn it back to Yana to cover our agenda and the objectives for today's meeting. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think this is the area for the next camp that we can really make a difference in addressing the risk issues, resiliency, and how it plays into the investment strategies of the state DOTs. Back to you, Yama. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And I'll wave to everyone for the celebration. Um, the purpose of the webinar series is to share lessons learned, ideas, and knowledge with the asset management community, building working knowledge of key concepts and definitions relevant to risk management and resiliency, beginning to apply this knowledge in order to answer the following questions. What opportunities exist to strengthen risk management and to improve your next TAM? What ben benefits can my agency expect by strengthening practices related to risk management and resiliency? What are key lessons learned from our last round of TAM development that can help improve risk management and the next TAM? We're hoping you'll use the webinar Q&A panel to share your questions for the presenters on these and other topics today. So for the agenda today, Jean Wallace of Minnesota DOT will kick off the webinar with a topic introduction. After Jean, we'll have Elizabeth Habeck of Federal Highways joining to provide an FHWA resiliency overview. Then we'll hear from Matt Lawfer of the North Carolina Department of Transportation will share NCDOT's advancements in building resiliency. And Mike Johnson of Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation, will conclude our presentation today, sharing with us how risk management is an integral part of their TAMP holding approach. So just another reminder, please submit your comments or questions using the Q&A feature. And, and as I said earlier, you'll get both the, um, the video and the slides on the tam.portal.com. So with that, let's get started with today's program. So first up is Jean Wallace with our topic introduction. Jean is Assistant Director, Modal Planning and Program Management Division with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. At MnDOT, Jean currently assists in leading one of the five divisions that includes capital programming, performance measures, risk management, asset management, statewide planning, and research. She's been with MnDOT since November of 2008 and has also worked for more than 14 years with the Federal Highway Administration. Jean is a Region 3 representative on the AASHTO Special Committee on Research and Innovation and currently serves as the panel chair on the NCHRP 2309 project scoping study to develop the basis for a highway standard to conduct an all hazards risk and resilience analysis. She recently served as the AASHTO representative on the World Road Association, also known as PRC, Technical Committee Strategic Theme um, A.3 A. A. Risk Management and she's the chair of the AASHTO subcommittee on AASHTO committee on performance based management subcommittee on risk management 
All right, with that, I'll hand it over to Jean. Thanks so much, Anna. Hello, everybody. And I'm glad to be joining you on this milestone 50th webinar. That's great. Um, it's been a very successful series so far. So I'm just gonna provide a quick introduction to this topic and start out with some definitions, um, maybe do some stage setting, and then talk a little bit about some of the current activities that are going on to build our knowledge base in risk and resilience. First of all, a little stage setting. This is a, a diagram that we often refer to in our um, AASHTO Enterprise Risk Management Guide um, and supporting the work of the Subcommittee on Risk Management. Uh, we know risk management, or we think risk management, is really kind of that linchpin between um, our known asset conditions and our performance um, of those assets. By identifying those risks, we can work to mitigate them, to manage and meet our performance objectives, and ultimately meet our, our strategic objectives. So we really think that there is a strong relationship between risk, asset, and performance. A few definitions and a, a point I want to make here at the end of this slide um, as well. So the way that we define risk is um, shown here, positive or negative effects of uncertainty or variability on agency objectives. This particular definition is common between both the ASHO ERM guide and uh, the 23 CFR 515.5, which is guiding our, our uh, TAMP plans. In addition, when we think about risk management itself, we think that's really the active processes, the procedures, uh, what we do to manage those risks. As you see, there are two different definitions there, one from the ASHTO ERM guide and another one from 23 CFR that are slightly different, but kind of get to the same point of it's really that process of managing risks. Whatever culture you need to put in place, whatever processes, structures, et cetera, whatever the framework may be, um, how you identify those risks and, and uh, quantify them or qualify them and then this, uh, manage them appropriately is that risk management process. And then finally, resilience. I've included two definitions here, one from FHWA Order 5520 and another from AASHTO, um, where what the point is really is that ability to uh, prepare for, to adapt to um, any disruptions either natural or man-made, um, and recover rapidly to those conditions uh, that might have, those disruptions that might have been caused. Um, so um, I think the, the main point here in, is there are at least two definitions, uh, probably more. In fact, when I think of the um, NCHRP primer for CEOs, on resilience. I think there are at least four definitions, four different definitions referenced in that guide. So that's kind of prompted some thought and um, research that I'll get to later. And the point being that risk and resilience together is still kind of a new concept. We're learning, but it's still kind of a new concept for most of us. So when we think about the risk-based TAMPs, we know that the TAMPs are there to create an inventory of condition and condition of our assets to find out what we know about our assets through uh, risk management. So identifying any and risks to those um, assets that could affect performance. We know that um, the TAMPs are there to really ultimately assist us in making those investment decisions to prioritize how we manage those assets appropriately to meet our performance objectives. And finally, we know that the TAMPs are there to really improve our resilience to any uh, external or disruptive, um, unplanned, planned, known, unknown, disruptive threats that may occur. So when we think about risk-based risk asset management and resilience together, again, it's still kind of new concepts for a lot of us. Um, and in order to do that effectively, you know, you really need to know where your assets are. You need to create that, um, condition inventory, you need to understand how critical those assets are in terms of um, service delivery, in terms of redundance, in terms of robustness. Um, you, we need to understand any potential risks that may occur to them, either natural or man-made, uh, the probability, the likelihood of occurrence of those, um, those uh, threats. 
um, and the impact. What could happen if something happens? In other words, what could be impacted? What could be the consequences? And then once we know those consequences, quantifying them so in, in order that we can prioritize how we react to those consequences. Um, that's really a critical piece of risk and resilience together. And so they're very strongly linked and the TAMPs really help us to, to help document that whole process and to manage appropriately and prioritize our resources that are what we know are very limited. There have been quite a few efforts to better understand risk and resilience. Uh, we know that uh, NCHRP Synthesis 527 is just one um, document that talked about resilience and transportation. And, um, and I mentioned earlier the, the CEO primer that uh, was also an NCHRP product on resilience is another good document that was published in 2018. Also recently finished is the NCHRP 08-113 project, Integrating Effective Transportation Performance Risk and Asset Management Practices. And we know that some DOTs like Colorado and Utah, and I think others, have had a lot of experience with um, a process that was developed by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, um, often referred to as RAMCAP, or Risk Analysis and Management for Critical Infrastructure Protection. It's really an all hazards approach to critical infrastructure risk assessment and risk management and prioritizing um, associated actions to avoid um, hazards. Finally, we know our FHWA has been a great leader in this area, uh, not only through um, uh, implementing FHWA Order 5520, but also guidance on resilience, uh, vulnerability assessments that they've helped support um, various reviews that have been done, certainly through the first round of TAMPs and lessons learned, and we know that we learn a lot from each other as well. So the previous work, just going to jump back a slide, this previous work on RAMCAP that was initiated through pilot studies that Colorado and Utah did 2016-2017 uh, timeframe really prompted an effort and interest I should say, by ASHTO's Committee on Transportation System Security and Resilience, as well as the subcommittees on Asset Management and Risk Management under ASHTO's Committee on Performance-Based Management to develop a problem statement to start to look more um, closely at developing really a standard uh, basis um, for an all hazards risk and resilience analysis. So this uh, proposal was developed back in 2018, and it was originally funded under the 20-44 um, program. Um, I believe that was it. Um, but ultimately it got converted to the regular NCHRP program and became project 23-09. Um, and essentially what it is, is we're just starting to take that initial look at what it might look like to develop an all hazards risk and resilience analysis. So it's just a scoping study. It's not a full product yet. Um, the project itself, um, actually the panel kicked off just over a year ago, January of uh, 2020, uh, when we could all still meet in person. And then uh, we've been virtual ever since, obviously. And uh, the project itself kicked off back in October with um, AEM, Corporation as the prime contractor. The scope and deliverables are listed there, as you see. Uh, one of the first things that was of greatest interest to, um, even as we were developing the problem statement with the Committee on Transportation System Security and Resilience, was developing a standard glossary of terms around risk and resilience. Um, as I noted earlier, there are a lot of different definitions of resilience, especially, and I think even um, as, as uh, various state DOTs talk to each other, resilience can often mean something a little bit different to each one. So we wanted to put some standardization around that. In addition, we want to conduct a state of the practice review on what's happening with risk and resilience, um, and then identify gaps in that state of practice. Where do we need to learn more? What, uh, what don't we know yet? Where do we need to build our, build our knowledge and experience and uh, strength in these areas? Finally, we want to take all of that information and develop a research roadmap going forward. 
In addition to that, we want to specifically develop some research problem statements that we can put forward for additional funding through NCHRP or other sources as appropriate, just to really start building, ultimately, a standard for conducting a risk and resilience analysis. Kind of a, I don't know if it will end up looking like a tool or what it will look like, but it's something that'll help all of us to do this on a standardized basis. So ultimately, I think we really, again, want to take something that takes an all hazards approach, something that looks across a, a system of transportation, um, not just specific asset categories. It, in, in that way, we can be sure that we're investing um, our, our limited amount of resources um, based on data-driven approaches um, and based on um, this idea that we know that we're gonna have to make trade-off decisions to do this appropriately. So if we're incorporating risk in this effort too, ultimately, we know that we're going to be able to prioritize in a way that's gonna help us manage the biggest risks. And also, you know, knowing that risks are both threats and opportunities, that we can find the biggest gains. I want to make you aware of an upcoming st stakeholder engagement uh, process through this um, project. Um, there is going to be an industry, a couple of industry workshops actually, two different opportunities in March and April, where um, participants will be able to share ideas and needs for developing this um, this all hazards approach. And um, again, those dates are listed there, March 22nd from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern or April 12th from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. If you're interested in registering, Excuse me, I know that um, this information was sent out to, I believe, the Committee on Transportation System Security and Resilience, as well as um, the uh, Subcommittee on Risk Management, and I think the Subcommittee on Asset Management too. But if you um, are interested in registering uh, or participating in this event, you'll need to register in advance. Please feel free to contact Maria Pena at AEM Corp. And um, I know that there are gonna be some additional engagement opportunities too as this project progresses. So we look to um, continue to get input from um, you know, all of us as practitioners and, and at all levels within our agencies to make this really the best product going forward and to ensure that it's gonna meet the needs of, of all agencies. And then finally, I just wanna put in a plug uh, shameless plug here for the ASHO Committee on Performance Space Management Subcommittee on Risk Management. Um, you can see our mission is listed there. It's really, uh, we're trying to do um, a lot in just building momentum and, and using risk management within state DOTs. And uh, so we meet every other month on the second Monday of the even numbered months from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we just had our February call, and I have to say our membership has really um, grown a lot. We had almost 50 people on that call. It was fantastic. Great participation as well. Um, we're actually doing some work on developing our own research roadmap for our committee, so it's really important, um, and it was a great opportunity that we had just a couple weeks ago to, um, to even um, get input on that research roadmap for ourselves. So our next call is uh, Monday, April 12th. And if you're interested in participating and aren't yet a member of the subcommittee, feel free to reach out to Matt Hardy, our AASHTO liaison, or you can also email me or Nathan Lee from Utah DOT, who is the vice chair. And with that, I think I am all done. Hiena, so I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you, Jean, for that introduction. All right, so again, just a reminder, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A panel. Um, our next presentation is from Elizabeth Habeck. Elizabeth is an environmental protection specialist at Federal Highways. She conducts research, technical assistance, and outreach to improve the sustainability of transportation networks and enhance the resilience and durability of transportation to impacts of extreme weather and climate change. She has 10 years of experience on these issues at the Maryland Department of Transportation and State Highway Administration as a Climate Risk and Resilience Program Manager. Elizabeth has worked on many transportation planning initiatives to include asset management, and she has an environmental background working on state projects for over 20 years. All right, now I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Thanks, Hannah. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here today and um, 
glad Steve uh, asked me to come in and talk about resilience. Um, is my screen still showing the way it's supposed to? Just want to make yes. sure. Yes. Seeing my presentation. Okay. Um, so, um, so anyway, um, I'm thankful for um, getting the invitation to come in and talk about resilience and risk and how um, how it relates to asset management. Um, I've worked on this for a long time and. Um, it's great to um, to do this with Federal Highway, and um, and uh, I want to start off by um, just going over, um, you know, what what's in the actual um, regulations. I'm going to have a few slides on that first, but the, um, you know, overall, I wanted to talk a little bit about life cycle planning, uh, focusing on risk because they're so related. Um, it's all very closely related. And um, basically, by looking at the um, by looking at the uh, regulations, um, you know the the regulation says that uh, we shall establish a process for conducting life cycle planning and in that life cycle planning process it's very specific to say that information should be included on current and future environmental conditions including extreme weather events climate change and seismic activity and other factors that could impact the whole life cycle uh, of the asset the whole life cost of the asset um, that's really important because i know there was a lot of confusion early on uh, about this being a 10-year tamp and um, I just want to make sure to um, to highlight that that it's it's really the whole um, life cost of the asset that we're talking about. Um, and in the next section in the regulation, um, it talks a little bit about um, identification of those risks. And again, it includes current and future environmental conditions, extreme weather events, climate change, seismic activity, and risks related to reoccurring damage. Um, this is uh, related to the part 667. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, with this um, reoccurring um, damage section of the, of the regulation. And um, I also wanted to point out the, um, the way that risk is defined. Um, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but in the regulation, um, risk is defined you know, in the definition section very broadly, but in, in vulnerability work, a lot of time when we're working on resilience, we tend to relate risk to uh, the likelihood of occurrence and the impact or consequence that they have. So I want to highlight that that is also in the regulation um, if you're thinking about how resilience fits in with um, with the risk that you're that you're trying to um, identify. And to be specific, that um, the identified risk should include prioritization of those risks. Um, a mitigation plan for addressing the top priorities and an approach for monitoring um, those top priority risks. Um, so then in comparing, um, you know, how risk, and, and I'm glad Jean and I were on the same page with definitions. So um, 23 CFR 515 defines risk very broadly as risk touches everything and it should be um, as being the positive or negative effect of uncertainty on agency objectives, um, when we think about it in resilience, uh, we often think about it um, as the likelihood and consequence um, that they have. So um, that might help when you're thinking about resilience to, to think about it that way. Um, <clears throat> and what is resilience? Um, this is the same definition Jean just gave out of Federal Highway Order 5520 um, to prepare and adapt to changing conditions. Um, what is vulnerability? Um, that it's different than risk. It's different than resilience. Vulnerability is a function of transportation systems, um, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Um, and it's really more about the systems or the assets ability to cope with any kind of um, threat or stressor. So it's, it's different than risk. And um, just to go over this a little bit, um, you know, we throw out all these terms. What is a vulnerability assessment? Um, really, is uh, a great place 
to start to just try to figure out where um, you may have more um, more issues on your assets or systems related to um, various stressors. So you can look and find out where um, where you might have the most impact during a particular event or how future precipitation or sea level or changes in temperature might impact uh, the way you can operate your system. Um, it doesn't have to be just um, you know, physical assets. It could also be your human assets, um, whether people can be out in uh, higher temperatures. And as far as vulnerability assessments go, that they can be system level and they can be project level. So um, you might have a broad statewide vulnerability assessment that you can use um, to look at your network, but you can also use it to identify locations where you might want to uh, do uh, some extra, not extra, but you may want to um, design a little differently or consider different um, issues that may become a problem in the future. So that could be incorporated in your early planning and your alternatives analysis or even in your um, engineering and design. Um, this is a document I wanted to highlight. Um, it's a synthesis of approaches for addressing resilience and product development. And there is uh, a section in there on pavement and soil. So um, amongst you know, some of the other topics um, for asset management, if you wanted to take a look at something that um, goes over resilience and how to incorporate it into your process for looking at risk, um, this, this report could be um, helpful. And um, uh, while we're on the topic of pavement, I wanted to mention that we, we held a couple peer exchanges last year um, in October and December with the um, pavement engineers from uh, academia, from, um, from industry, and from the DOTs. And um, I would say we had a, a very good turnout between the two peer exchanges. And the um, survey questions that we asked gave us some, some good information on what what the top concerns were uh, from those pavement engineers. Um, they were definitely most concerned um, for their organization when it came to inundation due to flooding, um, erosion and washout scour, and with sea level rise issues. So um, that was good information to, um, to, to get. And then we also asked what the most pressing pavement issue is now, and um, the number one, 76 percent said pavement design that takes flooding concerns into account. So um, I think the, the next couple here were how, how to make existing pavements more resilient rather than building something from scratch. Um, and then the other 43% uh, was pavement and me calibration for climate related inputs. So um, those, those were, um, that was good information to hear. Um, and, you know, if you're working on next year's TAMPS, um, pavement engineers may have some, some thoughts on how some of this could be uh, worked into what, they're, what they would like to see differently. Um, and then I just wanted to just touch on this. You've probably seen this before, but, you know, if, if we're not considering the future risks, um, we, we may not be getting the full picture with uh, deterioration rates. Um, you know, climate change definitely um, has um, potential to um, impact pavement and um, other assets so that they don't reach their intended uh, level of service. So if this happens sooner and it, um, it changes, you know, the way the scale works here with how often you need to um, fix or um, repair um, certain areas. So it's, it's just a good way to think about um, how if you're not considering these changes in the future, um, you, you may underestimate what is needed. Um, so these are some examples of resources from, um, from our planning office on resilience. There's um, lots of engineering studies like the Gulf Coast study. Um, there's specific engineering assessments on different kinds of assets, including pavements. Um, 
and there's the Hurricane Sandy project. There's guidance for engineers like HEC 25 and HEC 17 designing for um, in the coastal and riverine environments. Um, there's a nature-based solutions guide uh, with specific projects documented in there um, that were um, that were done along some coastal areas. And um, there's some planning documents, a vulnerability adaptation framework, and then finally the resilience pilots that have been going on for over 10 years now. Um, lots of states and MPOs have um, have participated in these pilot studies, and they're really a great resource if you're looking for any information on resilience. Um, so to get a little more in depth on those, um, there have been five rounds of pilot studies. And um, going back to 2010, the um, I, I just really wanted to highlight the 2017, 2018 uh, asset management pilots here. So, um, so you can see how broadly they these pilots have been scattered across the U.S. Um, so there's a lot of great examples and, and differences in what they've studied and um, what kind of impacts they have. So the six asset management pilot studies were the Asset Management Extreme Weather and Proxy Indicator Pilot Program. And um, most of these reports are online. I think two maybe haven't been put up yet, just, um, just getting the formatting done to get them posted. Um, but you can find these on our website. And um, there's the website available to you. And we're developing a guidebook to kind of take all this information together and um, put it all in um, in one um, place that could help um, just figure out how resilience and asset management work together. That should be coming out this year very soon. I know Steve wants it very, very soon. Um, and um, these are some other resources that, um, that I wanted to share just in case um, you haven't thought a lot about this. Um, there's, uh, of course, the, the pilots are listed at the top, and then there's um, the guidance on incorporating risk management into transportation asset management plans from 2017, um, the life cycle planning process, um, risk based asset management reports from 2013, and then AASHTO has integrating extreme weather into the TAMPS from 2015. Um, Incorporating resilience into the um, transportation planning process is another um, guide that's coming out this year. Um, the asset management guide is coming out this year. Um, I mentioned the hydraulic uh, circulars, um, HEC 25 and HEC 17. Those um, from our infrastructure office, um, HEC 25 is highways in the coastal environment, which is being updated to include uh, more information on sea level rise. So um, some of that might be very helpful. Uh, you might also be interested in the geohazards and extreme events and climate change resilience manual. That's coming out this year. Um, the 2018 to 2020 resilience and durability pilot studies were recently committed, completed, I'm sorry. And um, they were presented at TRB if anybody was able to attend uh, that workshop and see uh, what all the pilots have done. But the, um, there were 11 studies in that, in that pilot series, and um, those will be posted to our website over the next year. Um, CMIP is a data processing tool to downscale uh, climate data. So if, um, if you want to um, be able to use future climate projections, um, this tool is available on our website. It's just recently been updated. Um, and the user's manual for the new updated tool, um, that has not been posted yet, but if you use the new tool and have any issues, you can feel free to reach out to anyone in our office for help with that. Um, and then uh, we are working on a new NHI course called Addressing Resilience in Highway Project Development and Preliminary Design. So this is very exciting. Um, there isn't anything else on NHI right now on resilience. Um, so this course will be our first. And, it will have four uh, web-based trainings that can be taken and uh, a two-day in-person training. So that's all I have. Um, just wanted to list some contacts here, of course, from the Office of Infrastructure. You all probably know Steve Gay and Nostrand. 
Um, you can reach out to them. And from the planning office with Resilience, uh, Rob Capilanos, Heather Holsinger, and myself, uh, we're always available to help you if you need anything. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, all right. Next, we're going to hear from Matt Loffer. Matt is the Assistant State, State Hydraulics Engineer for the North Carolina Department of Transportation's Hydraulics Unit and has been with the department for 22 years. The Hydraulics Unit supports design operations and manages the department's compliance for stormwater and floodplain management. Matt manages the hydraulic design and highway uh, floodplain program and takes an active role in the department's flood resilience activities. He's a member of the Transportation Research Board Committee on Hydrology, Hydraulics, and Stormwater, and is a member of the AASHTO Technical Committee on Hydrology and Hydraulics. All right, Matt, it's yours. Oh, you're, you're muted, Matt. Thanks, Yana. <laughs> Yes, I can hear you now. Great, can you see my uh, screen as well? Yes, it looks perfect. Wonderful, all right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm thankful for this opportunity to present today. And I uh, just wanna also thank uh, Patrick Norman, our Director of Highway Operations for his support and vision as uh, DOT builds our more resilient transportation network. Um, so the North Carolina Department of Transportation, we're, we're kind of new to this, process in, in some ways. Uh, I think uh, 2018 was our wake-up call, one of our wake-up calls with Florence, at least it was for me. Um, but during our time together, I'm going to look forward to sharing you what you know specific actions that the DOT is undertaking to incorporate risk and resiliency into the department's TAMP. Um, we'll look into how disruptions and changing conditions are driving decisions, uh, making to improve our ability to absorb, restore, adapt, and provide equitable access. Um, we'll also look at the opportunities that have brought us to where we are today, um, some investments um, that allow DOT um, to really move forward with our resilience program. And then just I'm going to take you through some examples of what we're doing um, at DOT with our resilience program and how that integrates into the department's TAMP and support the full life cycle cost considerations you know, as we evaluate and manage the, the transportation infrastructure. Um, and then uh, let's see here. Also, just want to get into how we're doing that throughout the um, all phases of highway development. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about our research that we're working on and just conclude with some closing thoughts. Um, just to give a, a general overview of our, our TAMP in North Carolina DOT, um, published that in 2019, you know, as Elizabeth, Elizabeth was talking there about pavements and bridges was the main focus of that one. DOT maintains about 80,000 miles of roadway, um, about 5,700 miles of that are the national highway system. Um, we've got about 15,000 uh, uh, structures, MBIS structures over water, and then 3,700 of those are on the national highway system. And then and as a part of our TAMP, we were meeting or exceeding the federal minimum performance standards um, for the national highway system for pavements and bridges. Um, but this, this report's also coordinated with a, a, our legislative uh, mandate for our, what we call MOPAR, our Maintenance Operations Performance Analysis Report. So those, those two work hand in hand, and we publish that every two years. So there's a, there's a 2020 version as well um, that, that kind of just guides and directs how we you know, manage our assets and, and life cycle costs with respect to those and prioritization and that type of thing. So, um, but chapter five of our, um, our TAMP really focused on the risk management analysis and our risk register. So um, I'm going to be talking specifically to that with respect to hydraulics and flood and water. Um, that's kind of my area of, of, of expertise, I would guess. Um, so we've already seen some of these definitions from Jean and, and um, Elizabeth. Um, I think one of the things that I like about the definition we have in our TAMP, it's an event that is a deviation from the expected outcome. So you know, as, as managing a, net, a transportation network, you know, that deviation from expected outcomes is really important. Um, and, and we've seen these, we also look at, we're looking at vulnerability, um, you know, the, the extent to which an asset is susceptible. And resilience, we're definitely focused on the, um, the federal highway definition 
the ability to anticipate, plan for, and adapt to changing conditions and withstand, respond to, and recover rapidly from disruption. So if we can reduce the risk and vulnerability, you know, we can increase our risk to our um, resilience to our uh, transportation network. So let's go back to some of the disruptions. So we had Hurricane Floyd in 1999, significant event, it severely impacted uh, Eastern North Carolina. Hurricane Matthew came in, in in 2016 and caused over 730 um, washouts of pipes and, and bridges and, and caused significant destruction. And then Florence um, was a significant wake up call for the department, it happened two years later. But um, when Florence came ashore, you know, we had maximum sustained winds of 90 miles an hour, but it wasn't so much the winds, it was the, you know, the unrelenting rainfall and tornadoes that accompany, accompanied the event. We had record rainfall in Elizabethtown, North Carolina, where we had 35 inches of rain. Um, and then that rainfall from Florence resulted in catastrophic flooding. DOT reported over 2,500 roads closed. I-40 995 were closed for over a week. And the North Sea Cape Fear River crossed over the watershed boundary and flowed into the Cape Fear River, leaving um, US-421 destroyed. And Wilmington was waterlocked with major disruptions um, to goods and services. Total damages of that storm were around 227 million um, for the department. But that's not the only thing that's occurring as well. We've got these isolated severe storms that are also occurring. Um, these are two examples in, in 2019, seven and a half inches of rain in four hours um, in, in the middle of the state. And then more out to the Western state, we had another uh, event that same time frame that, that basically was another thousand year event. So we had 2000 year events. Um, uh, you know, we were seeing more frequency of these. And then another example of this is just in Johnson County. They had a thousand year event in, uh, during Matthew from a rainfall perspective. And then just on August 31st of this year, the same road was overtopped and washed out. And unfortunately, the loss of life there with two children. Um, and uh, even though we put improvements in after the Matthew event, you know, this area um, saw another event that was catastrophic and, and took out the roadway and bank and again. So instead of pipes there, we're going for going in with a bridge now. But uh, even, you know, looking at the 2020 sis, uh, season in North Carolina, we didn't have any major hurricanes, but we still had significant damage to our, our, our network and system. So um, with, with the events of this past year, you know, we had 90 bridges damaged, you know, 424 pipe and culverts washed out and just, and then of those 184 had to be replaced. So pretty significant damages um, occurring just due to these, these climate events. And then here's just a summary of those uh, with non-declared and, and declared events, you know, almost a billion dollars in, in damages over the last five years, just, just with the respect to these disruptions and climate climatic events. Um, and it, it, you know, there's climate assessments going on too. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but, you know, we're predicting nonlinear sea level rise. We have, you know, analysis showing stronger hurricanes and more frequent and intense rainfall events that are occurring. And these these trends are expected to continue. And most of this data is come from national climate assessment information. But basically the, the, the point here is that these things are, are continuing to um, occur and will occur. So um, opportunities, let's talk a little bit about opportunity. So, you know, an author is a tribute to Albert Einstein is saying that in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. And, you know, during Florence, we kind of had that. Um, I was at the uh, Joint Force Headquarters Emergency Operations Center in Raleigh when Florence was happening. And um, after a, a, a briefing by the secretary, he stopped me and just said, you know, Matt, we need to know what roads are going to flood when. And so you're, you're, you're sitting and going, we don't we don't do that. You know, we, we design these things, but we don't actually predict, right, when these things are happening. But, you know, we went to work and tried to figure that out. But, you know, basically we, all, we came up with a map that showed over 50 percent of North Carolina showing a no travel zone due to expected flooding. And um, so that was a, a true motivator. Um, and through partnership with uh, our emergency management and our consulting partners, you know, we're developing tools that will manage our assets during extreme events and prioritize, you know, help prioritize future projects. And then the other key opportunity that occurred recently, um, back in 2018, basically after Florence was the um, governor's executive order 80, 
Um, and it's basically, you know, the general goals of lowering statewide greenhouse gas emissions by 40%. Um, and also ask uh, that all cabinet agencies consider climate change and energy reduction in their day-to-day -day business. Um, so the section nine of that executive order asked for a North Carolina climate risk and resiliency plan. And that climate assessment has been completed and the initial resiliency strategies for the cabinet agencies have been developed. Um, and updates to the strategies are, are due in March 1st. So we'll have an update coming up for the Department of Transportation. And, and that executive order has provided a really unique opportunity for cabinet agencies to communicate and begin to build a more resilient North Carolina. Other part of the, uh, that's really important is investment. And in addition to opportunities, you know, um, this investment it, that from visionaries to look at the kind of data that we'll need to make better decisions in the future. So um, uh, Highway Operations Asset Management Group has inventoried over 375,000 pipes um, on, our, on our highway network. Um, we've got a, a pretty solid bridge management information system that we can pull data from. Um, in addition to that, the state's invested highly in LIDAR. So we've got, for most of the state, we've got eight points per square meter. So that really helps us build uh, a 3D elevation model of the roadway, which is depicted here. Um, and then we have a, a strong partnership with our emergency management uh, who does who has flood studies across the state. So we can leverage that information um, with our roadway network and the LIDAR information. And then we've also done a lot of uh, wave anal analysis and surge studies of our coastal bridges and really formed partnerships, partnerships with our, um, like I mentioned, emergency management. Let's see here. And then the department has really started on this initiative in the last year to, to really define what the resilience program at North Carolina DOT is going to be. So this has basically um, happened in the last six months, but we're really looking in the next six months, in the, next, in the future here to develop, develop a policy. So get the Board of Transportation to develop a policy around resilience and then develop programs that support that policy and then put into practice um, resilience uh, in the North Carolina DOT. So there's a, a, a significant effort going on here and it's it's all, all functions of highway management from long range planning, you know, design, maintenance operations, but we also have aviation, ferry, rail and freight um, and our other multimodal partners in, in, engaged in that process. So, so pretty exciting from that perspective. So let's talk a little bit about how we're doing this at North Carolina DOT. So we're looking into our long range planning and we're, we're setting up a, a strategic transportation corner, uh, corridor vulnerability assessment. And what we're first doing is we're looking at flood risk across our entire um, strategic transportation corridors, um, which include the rail um, and the highways and, and the national highway system. And so we're, look, we're using that 3D elevation model as well as the, um, our flood studies and overlaying those and figuring out you know, what, what frequency um, event causes overtopping of highway structures and where, and, and then looking at the depth of inundation and then prioritization of that. So we still have a lot of work to, there to do, but then we'll get into additional um, vulnerability assessment using their like RAMCAP or VAST tool, but uh, we're still in the initial stages of that. So that's like long range planning. And then from a planning perspective, and I think it was um, either Gene or Elizabeth that talked about that. I think it was Elizabeth that talked about, you know, on specific uh, projects, you need to look at what your resilience and what you're doing for resilience. Um, so, you know, you can protect that asset long term. So after the events of Florence in I-95 being flooded in 10 locations, we looked at how we could better um, protect that from you know, future storm events. So we incorporated a hundred year design um, into that, those active projects along I-95 and integrated that into the existing projects. And, and so that really set the stage for um, the feasibility of the actual projects that were going on along I-95. And so the, one of the areas of I-95 um, in the Southern part of the state around mile marker 13 is Lumberton. And this area was inundated for like seven days during um, during Florence and about four days during Matthew. But we, to do the design that we're currently going to design build in June, we, we uh, produced one of the largest 
2D rain on grid models that DOT's completed, 600 square miles of rain on grid, basically define the uh, uh, the resilience criteria for that for that project. So the 100 year design storm, but also how would it perform during Matthew and in, in, in Florence? So so we're using that model to set the roadway grade um, so that those that that facility will be protected um, in the future. So. Um, And then we're also looking at operations and maintenance across the state. We're looking at um, what areas of our system are vulnerable right now. This is just an example of a project where we got some grant money from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and working with the Coastal Federation are uh, working on nature-based solutions that basically um, help uh, build habitat as sea level rises, but also protects the infrastructure. So that current causeway has been, been overtopped by three hurricanes and we're going back in and, and in uh, plating areas uh, with with uh, more rock and but also establishing habitat um, uh, with um, long-term sea level rise um, in mind but then one of the important parts of of awareness of your assets is you know how are they performing during storm events and then elizabeth was talking about pavements and inundation so we're building these tools. Uh, this is called Feynman. It's the Flood Inundation Mapping Alert Network, and it's a it's a pilot web-based tool that used to provide officials at DOT and other emergency management stakeholders with real-time and forecasted where available flood inundation depths along roads, bridges, and other DOT assets. So we've implemented this in one um, river basin, and we're going to expand that. Um, but it, it provides real-time flooding impacts uh, to the bridges and roads and helps us make decisions and we can also do scenario testing. So uh, that's just a map of the North Carolina and some of those, those green dots are some of the monitoring points. Um, but we're looking at riverine surge, riverine areas, but we're also looking at um, the coastal areas as well um, with this product. And then the other part of the product we're implementing as a pilot this year is called Feynman T Surge. And so we're looking at um, taking information from SARA, which is a, the um, Coastal Environmental Risk Assessment. So it's running the ADCERT models. And so those tracks are coming in and we're taking that data from SARA and then integrating it into our, our 3D uh, roadway network and then predicting like 48 hours ahead of time what roadways along the coast will be impacted by that hurricane track. So um, we'll update that about every six hours as, as an event occurs. And then here's just another um, view of the colors indicate the depth of water on the network. And then we get we can you know pull summary tables of the roadway networks that are impacted as well as bridges and things like that. And then on our riverine systems, because we got the coastal plain and these areas get flooded significantly especially when we have a lot of rainfall in the piedmont and it runs towards the coast but it can be like seven days later and significant amounts of the coastal plain are being flooded so we've got the tool called Feynman T for rivering systems and again the same tool is going to help us predict you know what roadways will be inundated and for how long so from an asset management perspective we can actually just run this tool against a gauge for an entire year or something and figure out what you know roadways are inundated and to what extent and then look at you know maintenance requirements and things like that associated with the those events and the same Matt, Matt you have two minutes okay thank you very much all right thanks Anya. and then finally we've got another tool called bridge watch we're monitoring um, about 1500 structures there and we're looking at setting thresholds for freeboard um, low cord and overtopping and then looking at how uh, these this this product bridgewatch allows us to understand how our systems performing the bridges are performing during during these events so that uh, that product is um, we're in the development stages of that and um, it's it's definitely though giving us some good information during events and then we can go back and look at the how a structure is performed over the course of the year and then finally um, it's really important, like Elizabeth was talking about in Gene 2, is look at you know future conditions, like what's what's happening in the future. So we've got some uh, research with future precipitation for resilient design, where we're working with um, atmospheric scientists and using the global climate models to do some dynamic downscaling and looking at rainfall patterns and things in the future. 
and then running those in like the 2D model I mentioned for um, I-95 and that type of thing. Um, working to update our IDF rainfall information and then working on a host of just other studies to help um, understand better how we can manage our system um, uh, in the future. So the NCIHRP uh, 1561 and, and 2044-23 are, are of high interest to the department. And then, you know, finally, just building partnerships, right? So um, we would not be anywhere close to where we are without emergency management in North Carolina and that partnership with the, the Feynman system that I mentioned. And so these partnerships are really important. Um, AASHTO, you know, Federal Highways, TRB, um, and then the host of other uh, partners that we have with our UNC system, USGS, FEMA, NASA, and others out there that they're really helping us build a more resilient North Carolina. And just some closing thoughts, um, you know, I, I think you know, climate assessments identify that these extreme events will continue increase in intensity and frequency. Um, you know, we're working to, you know, take this information and then build a more resilient uh, North Carolina through, you know, risk and resilient strategies that will will help support the, the TAMP. And then, you know, most importantly, I think it's just the partnerships and relationships um, that that are, are needed to you know make these these systems successful so um really appreciate the the opportunity to talk and and, and look forward to um you know answering any questions that everyone might have so, thank you all right thank you matt for a great presentation now we'll hear from mike johnson mike is the caltrans state asset management engineer he's been with caltrans for 30 years and is in his current capacity, he's responsible for leading the implementation of asset management and the development of the State Highway Operation, Operation and Protection Program, better known as SHOP. The SHOP is a $4.5 billion annual program of projects that address rehabilitation and operation needs for the state-owned transportation system. Mike has held numerous national positions with TRB, AASHTO, and with the FHWA TAM Expert Task Group. He has published numerous papers in the areas of bridge inspection, bridge management, and asset management. Now I'll turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Yana. Um, appreciate the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today I'm gonna just give a little bit of an overview of kind of the Caltrans perspective of risk-based asset management. Um, you know, you've heard a couple of our early speakers talk about the regulations, and I guess I'm gonna start off um, talking about money rather than the regulation. And the reason I wanna do this is to really underscore why risk-based uh, assessments are so important in the TAMP, because when you look at the available funding that you have, you know, beyond just payment and bridge, if I look at all physical assets that represent the transportation system in California. And I'm spending about 58% of available funds on those. Risk-based uh, investments and mitigation represent about 20%. And then everything else that we're doing is, is the remaining 22%. And the reason I, I put this slide up is because the risk mitigation is in effect competing against the condition of your physical assets and probably the performance of your system in terms of safety and, and congestion and other things. So there's, there's one pie of funds that every agency is working with. And to the extent that you aren't looking at risk, um, I think you're, you're, you're really selling your overall investment plan a little bit short. So while there is a federal requirement, I, I would think that there's actually really good incentive for why agencies wanna look at this um, because if you get surprised by some of these risks, if they're realized and you're surprised, more often than not, it's going to mean that some other projects that you thought were going to go are not going to actually happen because you need to redirect the funds to address um, the, the emergency that you didn't, um, you weren't able to plan for. So, you know, for agencies looking to, you know, to get into this for their 2022 TAMP, um, I just kind of went back through the things that we looked at in our 2018 TAMP. 
with the hindsight of some lessons learned. And so, you know, this is not all risk categories that you might consider, um, but I, I've kind of highlighted a couple here. Um, and, and there's a few that are bolded outside of the highlight, but these are the ones that, you know, that we're really focusing on for our TAMP. Some of the other risks that are shown up here, you know, things like succession planning, continuity of operation, these are important things for an agency to think about, but I would argue maybe they're not the most appropriate thing for, uh, for your transportation asset management plan. So we kind of take this big broad world um, you know, we, we recognize that there could be sudden change of funding, for example. Um, you know, we didn't anticipate COVID-19 in our 2018 TAMP, and probably no one else on this call did either. If that occurs, we just, will, you know, we're willing to accept that risk, right? It just happened that we, you know, the risk was realized in the last year. Um, but in terms of our TAMP, we, you know, we acknowledge that it was sensitive to funding, but how we could really plan for that isn't really clear to me at this point. So we're kind of focusing in on those things that are reasonably predictable, that we feel will have a direct impact on our other investments. Um, and, and that's what we, you know, we kind of go through this matrix approach here um, when we develop our TAMP. Um, you know, we're dealing with all the same risks that probably many of you have, um, you know, certainly being a coastal state, um, you know, we have, um, you know, we have sea level rise concerns, um, you know, the, the photo on the upper left, I mean, we, we lost a section of highway uh, just last week in, into the Pacific Ocean from some heavy rainfall and so geotechnical instabilities is something that definitely affects our transportation system. Um, you know, we've been uh, really mitigating seismic risk for over 30 years in California, but the, the kind of the lower left photo shows, well, you know, if, if you don't take care of that risk, then you may be buying a new bridge um, because you, you know, the risk was realized and now the bridge has got to be demolished and rebuilt. Plus we got to buy a couple of mini storage facilities in this case. Um, and then bridge scour uh, is, is probably the single largest cause of bridge collapse in California. Um, and this is something that we've been tracking and working to mitigate for many years. The challenge that you have with, it, with an asset management plan is that each of these um, risks that I just talked about is assessed using a different type of scale. So I'm just showing a few of them. We have, you know, a landslide susceptibility scale. We have a seismic scale in the middle, and then on on the lower right, um, we recently uh, the department's recently completed vulnerability assessments for all 12 of our districts, and that those vulnerability assessments were looking um, primarily at climate change impacts, so things like extreme heat, fire, drought. Um, sea level rise, extreme rainfall, all of these are part of these climate change vulnerability assessments. And, and so, you know, when you look at how, how you go about doing this, um, you know, this is clipped out of one of our vulnerability assessments. I mean, you know, we certainly have to understand, you know, which, which portions of our transportation system are gonna be possibly impacted. And, um, you know, th there was a number of approaches that have already been presented today that look at, you know, how you might um, look at, let's say, a, a, a sea level rise or a river flooding situation. That's just one potential risk to the system. And so you've got to look at the whole scale of, um, of risk that you want to evaluate. And then, you know, and then, um, the new one for us is climate change. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that because there's some unique aspects to it there. But at the end of the day, you, you've got all these risks, um, you have limited money, and you have to somehow um, identify a means to prioritize them so that you can address those that are going to be the most consequential if realized or, um, or, or those that can be done um, and cover, you know, critical routes at, at an affordable rate. 
Um, I mentioned sea level rise um, because our, our vulner vulnerability assessments looked at these. Um, and basically what the assessment did is just looked at uh, various climate change models um, that looked at future emissions levels and also risk tolerance. And so this risk tolerance is kind of a, um, uh, maybe not a new term if you're familiar with uh, risk, uh, risk management, but it's something that in a transportation sector, you know, you need to start talking to, you know, your folks within your own department and partners um, in, in transportation about what people's risk tolerances are and what they're willing to accept and not accept. Um, in this case, this, this graph is showing a whole range of potential sea level rise uh, mitigation costs. So, you know, the challenge with something like sea level rise is, one, it's not all here right now. And so there's this time component that I think is a new, um, kind of a newer feature for the TAMP. In other words, as we go further in time, the, the likelihood um, that you're gonna have new infrastructure impacted grows. And so that's a new dynamic and the time scales are really pretty long. So if you're looking at a 10 year um, transportation asset management plan window, um, as you can see from this graph, you might, you might really miss the big picture of what's coming you know, 20 years down the road or, or longer. And then depending on how good we do as a society in addressing uh, emissions that are causing uh, sea level rise and the storm surge associated with sea level rise, um, you know, we could have differing outcomes. And these outcomes, um, all of these numbers presented here, they're all billions of dollars. So you could have, you know, if you look at a 2100, dramatically different outcomes, depending on how well we are at mitigating uh, the impacts in the first place. So the challenge for any DOT that's working on risk is to, is to figure out how are we going to evaluate these various risks? In other words, um, you know, maybe my geotech folks could give me a list of, you know, one through 50 locations that are ranked and, you know, my structures folks could give me seismic, you know, seismically vulnerable bridges that are ranked. Um, and then you've got, you know, our planning group doing these vulnerability assessments for climate change and, and our hydraulics folks looking at scour and flooding issues. But they're looking at relative to that one risk. And in, in asset management, you have to look at it across the spectrum of risks. And so, you know, how, how you do that is something that we've been spending a little bit of time on recently in, in a research project in Caltrans. And, you know, I put kind of the classic risk matrix that you see, you know, and, and you've got consequence on the bottom, likelihood of occurrence um, on the vertical axis. Um, but I've added, you know, a little bit more parameters. So if you're going to try to do this in your TAMP in a, um, a, a qualitative way, then I, I would recommend that, you know, you put some real parameters on likelihood of consequence. And, you know, in our case, you know, maybe it's years. So we're going to look at something that, you know, might happen, you know, once a year or in a case of like a major seismic event, we might not have one, you know, in in cycles that are more than 25 years apart. However, when we have one, the consequence is severe. And so then you look at, well, how do you measure the consequence? And um, in this case, I'm, you know, I'm using a scale that is really for demonstration purposes, but um, using a scale that to look at loss of uh, a lane or an entire route and the duration of that loss and, and using that as the criticality scale. You, you could also use other things in your TAMP, like you could you know, look at potential loss of life, um, if that's something that you could quantify. But I think for the purposes, if you're just kind of starting out, you know, these, these consequences seem a little bit easier to um, you know, qualitatively assess. And then, you know, so this is kind of where we are today. It's like, you know, my question is, well, how do we combine four or five or six different risk categories that were all assessed independently together into something that makes sense for a global 
transportation asset management plan so that when I make investments in risk mitigation, I can look across the spectrum of risk and know that they've been uh, appropriately uh, prioritized. So one approach is to monetize the risk, and this is uh, one of the you know one of the areas that we're looking in. And the monetization approach uh, helps in the sense that you you take all the units. Sorry, folks. Um, let me know if you can't see the slides for some reason. Uh, but you take all the risks that you have and um, uh, you try to monetize the not only the likelihood but also the consequence into into units of dollars and if you can do that then you can you know you can look across all the risk levels and compare dollars to dollars in a in a way that allows you uh, to combine these things um okay hang on I'm, i've lost my sharing for a minute Apologize for that. Let me get back to where I was here. Okay, so, so getting back to the importance here in the TAMP, um, you know, the TAMP has is looking at uh, competing uh, competing interests, and when you look at that from a risk management standpoint. Um, you know, you, you want to look at, uh, you know, what exactly, uh, you know, what exactly are my risks, how much do I need to spend, and, and then how does that impact my condition of my assets or things like safety and congestion investments that you might have. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, the risk mitigation is competing with all of these other things. And you know, if you have set this up well in a risk framework, then you can at least understand what's to be expected given a certain investment level. So if we're gonna you know, carve out some investment for risk mitigation, you need to know where you're gonna make that investment and then you know, what are we gonna gain from that investment? Because on the other side, you, know, you could very clearly show what you're giving up in terms of okay, I'm gonna move investment away from condition improvement of physical assets to risk mitigation. I need to be able to explain why that's being done and if it's okay to do that, show that it's okay to do that. That process of you know, sort of straddling investment across risk and condition and, and really system performance is still something that has to be done very manually. Um, and so it's kind of a trial and error uh, approach, I would say a trade-off approach where, okay, if we invest this much here, what are we gonna give up on the condition side? Understand that now our future conditions of physical assets may be a little bit worse than they could be if I didn't invest in any mitigation, but if I make the investment in mitigation, maybe I can avoid some catastrophic losses that would then in turn put pressure right back on my physical asset investment. So it's somewhat circular. Um, and, you know, in, in California, at least in Caltrans, you know, we don't have a, um, a magic tool that you could push a button and get these answers. It, it really takes, you know, experience and judgment and a lot of trial and error to kind of hone in on what makes a really, um, a really good investment plan. So, uh, I mean, in conclusion here, you know, I think the risk management provides a way, you know, for agencies to, to plan for risk-based events. Um, I do, you know, I don't believe all risks that, in, that a Department of Transportation faces belong in the TAMP, um, you know, but I think once you decide what you want to evaluate, uh, qualitative assessments can help an agency evaluate risks on a common scale with some judgment, um, you know, Alternatively, multiple risk can be evaluated using a monetization approach. But even the monetization approach has assumptions um, and cost factors in there that you know, are subject to some judgment. Um, and so at the end of the day, when you take all of this in within your TAMP, you've got to develop a, a financially constrained 
investment plan. And that investment plan, in my opinion, should include risk mitigation to some degree. And that is often really a judgment um, decision uh, between you know, what you're gonna give up to get that risk mitigation, what you would gain by doing the risk mitigation. And to do all of that, you really need to understand you know, what is the agency's risk tolerance or what is the risk tolerance of your constituents so that you can make that plan appropriate. Yeah, I can take over. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation. Thanks, Mike. Um, we've had a, a power outage here. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna step in for Jana. This is Perry uh, with Spy Pond. Just one minute, I'll pull up the slides here. Great. So we've had uh, quite a few questions come in, and the first question. Now this one may be a, a question for for Steve. Uh, it's from Zoe Nederland uh, in Vermont, and question is. Would you mind noting if there was a conclusion whether the next step is due in four years from the last deadline or from the state's uh, conformity letter? The next state asset management plan should be submitted four years from when your 2000, when your, your last camp was certified. Our records indicate that all the teams received their certification in 2018. If you think maybe it's different, please contact your division office and they can be in contact with us. So it's since the last camp processes were certified, which was uh, 2018, it's not the uh, consistency determination dates. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Perry. So our next question uh, is for Elizabeth, and it's, uh, are the findings of the Pavement Resilience Peer Exchange available online? No, um, <clears throat> it hasn't been posted yet. Um, the, um, the findings from the Peer Exchange will be put into a paper that we hope to have out this summer. Excellent, okay. Um, the next question, uh, I think we'll open it up uh, to the full panel. And Gene, maybe I'll we'll start with you. Uh, from the presentations, it seems that risk and resilience should be addressed together. Do you think this will be the kind of approach that's recommended in the future? Um, yeah, I do think it's the kind of approach that will be um, addressed or recommended in the future. And I think they really go hand in hand together. I think. Um, Right now, it, it feels kind of like a, a layering process to me um, to add resilience on top of risk management in a way. Um, maybe that's just a visual way that I look at it, but I, I agree that uh, they're very much hand in hand. I think uh, you know Mike and Matt's presentations both reiterated that, so I hope they, they also agree with that. Hey, welcome back, Yana. Um, Elizabeth, would you yeah. like to um, take on the next? I'm sorry. Would uh, would you like to take that one next? The uh, the future um, uh, coordination of risk and resilience. I'm sorry. I, I think the question the, uh, is about is... kind of. I think the question, Elizabeth, is just um, the the issue of um, combining risk and re resiliency together. And is this going to be the recommended approach in the future? And just so, well, so I, I guess the yeah, the way that the the regulation is written is to consider <clears throat> the risk of um, you know of various impacts on your your assets. So um, the way that we look at resilience. Um, it's just a way to consider those those risks um, and especially when it's the natural environment type of risks um, at least from from my my perspective i'm not an expert on the the other financial risks and and those sorts of things but um, with the natural environment kind of um, 
resiliency issues that you have. That's just a way to at least analyze your system and figure out what risks you have out there to consider in your asset management. All right. Any other um, responses to that question about, you know, in the future, do you approach it together? Um, do you approach it separately? Should it be together? And, um, and Steve, you know, is that something you're thinking will be a future recommendation? You know, I, I believe in the current language of the regulation. If you look at the preamble, you do have discussion about resilience and risk together. But I think also if you look at it, the resilience issue can probably should we look at when you're doing your performance gap analysis. You know, not as so much on condition, but on performance of the network. So I think it's an interacting combination of how all these things work together. But yeah, my initial thought is, and it's, you know, maybe even said on one of the previous webinars, is risk a subset of resilience or is resilience a subset of risk? I think it really is maybe a little bigger than that. So it's an mm -hmm. interesting topic for all the state and other mm -hmm. owners, how they look at it. Back to you. Yeah, Matt, how about you? Yeah, I think I think from a department of transportation, it's easier to s sell resiliency program, right? We have a, a new uh, department in the state of North Carolina called the North Carolina Office of uh, Recovery and Resiliency, right? So it it, it formulates a, a more positive perspective on things. And so you definitely have to look at risk as you develop your resilience program. But I think, you know, as you adapt, um, you know, to the changing conditions and then address the disruptions, you know, and then you look at the risk as associated with those activity, those those events, right? Um, then I think resiliency kind of is is good from a practitioner standpoint. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you have a thought? Um, yeah, I, I have a thought. Sure. Um, I, I guess <laughs> I'll I'll talk a little bit about the seismic example in California because um, we have very resilient structures to seismic events now. It didn't. Uh, come overnight and it wasn't cheap. But when we have a seismic event that, you know, many agencies on this call would get excited about, it's not an issue for us in California because we've we've hardened our, our bridges. We've made them more resilient to this natural occurring event. So yes, seismic is a risk. If we mitigate it, we avoid the damage and the damage can be billions of dollars. And so to me, this all comes back to what you know what is the best life cycle decision to make here is it better to invest up front and harden your bridges for the risk of an earthquake or you know tolerate that risk and then if the risk is realized now you're buying new bridges right and so you know if you look at it in the context of life cycle i think you you can't come to any conclusion other than risk and resiliency have to be treated hand in hand Thanks, Mike. All right, so we have um, two remaining questions. Oh, all right, so um, this one's from Matt Hobrick. Uh, Matt's presentation raised a question for me. I've been thinking about the emergency response program as basically serving as an insurance plan that lowers the amount of financial reserves states have to keep in response to disaster events. However, Matt, showed a slide that suggests that only a small part of the disaster event costs were reimbursed, even for declared events. Do we have any national data that shows the efficacy of the ER program as an insurance plan for DOTs? Do we need some kind of more robust national asset insurance program for road assets to help states mitigate our risk? I, um, <laughs> okay, maybe Elizabeth, do you want to start? Um, I was actually thinking maybe that was Steve. <laughs> I don't okay. know. Okay, um, Steve. <laughs> I admit I do not have a answer for that question. I can try to inquire. Okay. I can offer one up, Hiana. Um, mm -hmm. you know, when you when you have an uh, a natural event. 
um, agencies will often apply for for funding, ER funding or emergency repair funding. Um, that is only a, what's available nationwide is just a fraction. It's only a fraction of what California spends on an annual basis, and and you know it has to be spread over um, you know all states in the country. So you know ER funding is, is not the answer. So you're getting reimbursement for your um, you know your natural events isn't really going to happen. And and so if you think of it that way. The agency is going to pay to restore these this infrastructure one way or the other, and so you're either going to do it after the damage has occurred. You have this unplanned disruption, or you're going to work on making your system more resilient in advance. And the the challenge is always how do you carve out those resiliency funds when you're competing against all these other things that you want to do? And that that's there's no easy answer for that. But if you do your tamp right and you have the components in there and you can show that, look, if we don't carve out some funding to do mitigation, then you know we could in the long run incur greater costs. Thanks, Mike. The last question is for you also. Um, we've been using, um, this is from Simon Lewis, we've been using a failure mode and effects analysis to risk rank bridge elements using criticality and vulnerability to prioritize both maintenance and capital spend and inspection frequency based on an risk prioritization number. Have you considered this approach? We've we've ranked our bridges several times um, beginning in the early 90s. Uh, we did initial screenings. There, very technical and I don't want to get into all of the technical parameters, but a lot of them have to do with how the bridge was built in the first place. So that's part of it. That's part of its vulnerability. The other part of a bridge's vulnerability is what is its what is the expected ground motion at that location? And that is generally a function of distance to known faults. And so in California, we look at um, distance to known fault, expected peak ground acceleration after an event. And then we look at what are the inherent structural design and or construction vulnerabilities of that site. So that's sort of, you know, um, that's all on the consequence side. The likelihood of an event is something that you can problematic or, or probabilistically determine um, using statistical models. But, but again, this gets back to agency risk tolerance. If your agency's risk tolerance for a collapsed bridge is not there, then sometimes the probability doesn't matter. And I would say that was the case in California. We had a major earthquake in 1989 um, that was followed in Loma Prieta in the Bay Area, which everybody watched during the World Series. Then we had a, another major earthquake a few years later in Southern California. And after that, there was no risk tolerance for seismic events anymore. And so the decision was made, we're going to harden all these bridges, make them more resilient in an asset management terms. And to do that, the department had to forego a lot of the normal work we would have done to be able to have staff to do the work and have the budget to do that work. But at the end of the day, now we're at a place 30 years later where you know, we can have a, a an earthquake of pretty sizable magnitude. It, it's not even it, it's not even causing major any I don't say no damage, but it's not causing any major damage, and we're not seeing collapses. So, you know, now we're kind of on the payback portion of that early investment. You know, so I, I guess to answer the question, you know, there's different approaches. I, I'd maybe have to take the conversation offline to understand exactly what you're doing. And, you know, we could certainly share what we're doing in California or what we've done. Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you everybody for staying a little extra, all of our panelists and all of our attendees as well. So we'll be back soon with our next and last webinar in the mini series. We hope to have it scheduled for March. Uh, we'll get the notice out as soon as we can. 
and and then we'll resume our regular bi-monthly series in April, um, same you know third week uh, Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, and um, and just check in with the Ashto Tam portal um, to check on the next um, set of dates. I uh, just wanted to also let everyone here know that um, the TPM webinar series, which is on the every other month that the TAM webinar series is not. Um, so in March, actually on St. Um, on uh, St. Patrick's Day, the topic is risk management and TPM. And I think Gene, you're back with us for that one. And so please join us for that. And there you can go to the TPM uh, portal to the events to register for that one. So hope to see you in um, uh, two webinars in March. All right, bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, President.